Good evening. My name is Teresa Scandiffi, and I'm the Director of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special event. I've been thinking about this, and five years ago when we opened this building, we envisioned it to be a space where films could be shown as the filmmakers intended, whether it was 35 or 70 millimeter, 4K, various digital iterations. We hoped we would have the opportunity to host filmmakers, writers, producers, actors, anyone in passion to share um, their love of film with the audience to create a collaborative film education for our community. So tonight is a very beautiful moment for us at TIFF. We're honored to have with us today a truly talented and thoughtful director, screenwriter, producer, and movie lover, Richard Linklater. <laughs> and as if that's not enough, he's here to tonight to share his latest film, Everybody Wants Some, with our audience. Um, so. First, some thank you. Yeah, you can, you can give a shout out to that. Some thank yous to the folks who support us on an ongoing basis. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, Government of Canada, Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. A few reminders to please keep your phones on silent, please don't take photos, but we do encourage you to tweet afterwards using the hashtag TIFFLinkLater. Uh, during the Q&A, following the screening, so don't go anywhere, there's going to be a Q&A, um, please wait for the microphone to reach you. And a big thank you goes to our friends at Paramount Pictures Canada for making this event possible. We have mad love for Eileen and Anne and their crew, so can we please give a huge round of applause for them. So a brief overview for the format. Um, Richard Linklater will join us on stage for a brief on-stage conversation about his career, setting up his new film. We'll then screen Everybody Wants Some, and then he'll come back for a Q&A with you uh, following the screening. So our special guest. We have among us today a truly visionary filmmaker whose love of film and movie culture is on display in the large body of work he's made over the last 20 years. And to be sure, he's just getting started. Filmmaker, screenwriter, and producer Richard Linklater has directed 18 feature films, including the 70s cult hit Dazed and Confused, the Before Trilogy, winning the Berlin Alley Silver Bear Award. You, can, you guys are so polite. You can applaud at any time. For Best Director for Before Sunrise, the hit comedy School of Rock, A Scanner Darkly, Boyhood, for which he received numerous Academy Award nominations and received multiple accolades and awards. Mr. Linklater has had a long history with the Toronto International Film Festival, beginning with the North American premiere of Dazed and Confused in 1993, as well as screenings of films such as Waking Life, Tape, School of Rock, and Me and Orson Welles here in Toronto thereafter. He also serves as the artistic director for the Austin Film Society, which he founded in 1985 to showcase films from around the world that were not typically shown in Austin. It's a great honor for us to be able to host him here tonight for this special occasion, so please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So, thank you for coming to show us. This film is a lot sure. of fun. I can't wait for the audience <laughs> yeah. Q&A. Um, it's a mini kind of onstage conversation. It's not our usual, like, longer career, and he's very prolific. So the way we decided to organize it was to focus on a theme that kind of goes throughout your film, uh, many of your films, which is this through line of, of moments of time, of, of moments in, in people's lives. And sometimes it's the signposts, but often it's the in-between that makes up how we actually shape our lives. So um, having said that, I encourage all of you during the Q&A to um, ask about his other many films, as well as his latest one, which I think you're going to have a really good time. Um, so we're just going to jump right in to 1991, 1993, um, Slacker. Uh, yeah, give a shout out. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's mentioned often that it's this groundbreaking film that you, you know, changed the way that people were making film, independent filmmaking style. When you made this film, were you thinking that it was counter to anything else before it? It, it didn't get in the Toronto Festival, by the way. Um, 
Um, <laughs> that, just, you know, you never forget shit like that. Um, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, to me, that was a portrait of kind of the late 80s where I lived. It was one of those backyard kind of movies. Mm -hmm. um, but it also was a kind of a, a idea I had about five years before when I was first falling in love with cinema. You know, I think that's the time when you're kind of, you know no boundaries, you know, you're attacking your art form, you know, physically and thinking of all the possibilities. And I was thinking, well, why couldn't you make a film that just went from character to character and no, no real story, but just a series of, you know, that. And uh, so I thought about that for five years and then finally I got a chance to make this kind of crazy, this crazy movie that made no sense on paper. And I've, if I have one recurring thing in my life, it's I'm always trying to explain what I'm trying to do and it never makes any sense on paper. Even the script sometimes don't read in a way, but I'm always, I'm lucky I get to make films at all because, you know, often they're kind of hard to explain. So um, I think that was the first one. On a narrative front, that that movie has no real plot or story. It just has characters and moments. And so I agree, yeah, a lot of my, films are really just these moments and, and people and, and but I, I believe that cinema you know that's always kind of I think it's inherent in my early cinematic uh, thinking you know so so I don't know but I, I feel like you're able to write some things down and they're pretty articulate I don't know if you have seen the Criterion Slacker release it's amazing and in it he has a Basically, a book the of manifestos. It is so wonderful. It's a great final resting place for your film, <laughs> you know, because it just throws in so much stuff, and it's it's great. I was they they do such a good job as a filmmaker. You're so honored because they're so thorough, and they they have both. The, they're putting out the before trilogy and Boyhood are in the Very works. Cool. So I just it's always great to work with them. But yeah, Slacker is this crazy 16 millimeter no budget movie, but it they, they put in all the little ephemera, you know, from it. Well, and you have these. Yeah, these manifestos about how to cast mm -hmm. and and moments of what cinema is. It should be natural and live cinema, live cinema, like this. I, I love it. Uh, you know, youthful you yeah. Know, enthusiasm, yeah. There's like Brasson and Cayeta cinema in there and like revolutionary notions. It's it's an amazing book. Definitely pick it up. Um, so we're kind of jumping to just two years, to Dazed and Confused in 93, which focuses again on a very specific moment of high school. But it's a different style of filmmaking from Slacker. Um, how did you get this idea for making this movie? Where did it come from? Well, it's why I was, while I was making Slacker, I was thinking, God, I, I just want to, it suddenly kind of bubbled up in me. I want to do a film about high school. You know, I want to do a film about those years, but I want to do my version of, of it, um, which it's just all character based. I mean, it's similar to Slacker in the way it's just a bunch of characters and not a big plot. And it's kind of a similar time structure. Slacker was kind of exactly about 24 hours. Dazed was about 18 hours, you know, less time, but it was just contained within a, that time uh, frame. But it was just the last day of school. So I just had all these ideas I got to think about and write a bunch of notes. But then after Slacker, I felt like, okay, that's the film I want to do next. And found myself in the, you know, teenage film genre, you know, whatever that is. But it was at, at that time, I think, there weren't really a lot of, the 80s had had like the John Hughes films and things like that, but this was like my own version, you know, of high school, which was no, I just remember like riding around trying to look for a party, you know, that was like not much happening actually, but everything happening, you know, it wasn't like big drama, but that's just, I guess that's how I think, or I think a film can be that. My first idea for Dazed was, it always starts off kind of experimental. You know, I just had a, a guys in a car driving around the whole movie. You saw it from inside the car with ZZ Top's Fandango, the eight track just played over, you know, it would skip and keep going, you know, so it goes over a couple times and that would be the whole movie. Listen to the album twice and never leave the car, but they would be interacting with people outside the car, getting in, you know, races and chases and, you know, you know, I don't know flirting with girls and, you know, someone goes in and gets a six pack of beer, you know, whatever, it would all happen. That was my earliest kind of uh, idea, but it obviously expanded from there. But you have to have that first like tonal impulse, I think, for a movie, so. So I'd like to set up the first clip from Dazed and Confused, which is um, this, you know, when you're finishing one moment and you're, and, and you're starting another, there's always a transitional and period and, and a ritual that can sometimes 
mark one moment to another. So we're gonna we're gonna show a clip from Days of Confused and then talk about the movie a little bit more. So you mentioned a bit about ZZ Top when you were first imagining it. When you when you were thinking about the scene, did you have that song in your head? No, actually the Alice Cooper song, I you know, it was in the editing. I would wake up every day with like a different song in my head and that one that, that started that sequence started coming together. But that was a lot of them were in the script, but that one wasn't. The, the Alice Cooper no more Mr. Nice Guy that came, uh, you know, somewhere along the way. So it works both ways. Sometimes you have it in the script, it's you know, integral to the idea, and then sometimes you just you sort of find it. And you get the you know, inspiration the during shooting or in editing. Yeah, you just leave yourself open to those to those ideas. And same thing on the new movie. I had some were in the script, and some you know you just you find in the editing a lot of a lot of options. So. How did you go about <laughs> casting for this movie? For Dazed. Yeah. Yeah. For some of well, these characters. You know, you know what you're looking for, but gosh. It's kind of like love at first sight. When when people come in, you have in mind a character. You know, you've spent time theorizing about them, but you kind of know it when you meet them. You know, I can I remember very distinctly meeting the whole cast. Like Parker Posey walks in the door, opens her mouth, starts. I was like, <laughs> "You're amazing. I don't know who you are, but you know, you've got to be in this movie somewhere." And then you talk, "Okay, well, you're Darla." You know, uh, I could say that to almost every actor in it. Um, some were it did took a while to figure out what part they would play or you know some some parts are harder than others to cast and sometimes there's just some really big decisions to make with an ensemble i mean sadly there's so many so much talent out there there's so many great actors in the world and so few relative you know parts and opportunities for them so often there's a couple people that you could almost flip a coin they're both great and it would just put a different shade and often you're making the decision just based on the ensemble, how it looks aesthetically, how it feels, how these people will feel next to each other, who will stand out. And it comes down to like, oh, well, there's already someone who kind of seems similar, you know, size, build, hair color. You know, it can be as random as that, and it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, actors don't want to hear that. Oh, you were kind of look like that other guy, <laughs> you know. I remember actually it was Cole Hauser, the red-haired guy who plays Benny. It was really between he and Vince Vaughn for that part, Vince Vaughn was very funny, very good, he got it. But I'd kind of already cast Ben Affleck and they're about the same size. You know, I was kind of like, Cold's different than Ben, you know, so it's as random as that, you know. Wow. Vince has never spoken to me again. But <laughs> it's a, you know, it comes down to something as random as that. It really doesn't even have anything to do with acting like ability. It's sort of like, what colors on your palette do you want to enter into it? So it's it's a tough process, but. I think I've gotten better at it over the years too. The new film was um, similar kind of thing, big ensemble, young actors, not a lot of uh, very well-known actors. Some, a lot of people making their uh, debut, and this is their first film. So it was very similar to Dazed in that way. But uh, I was even more aware of like the team, because it's even about a team. So it's kind of the cohesion and the uh, what roles they'll play and, and how they'll get along, how they look together, but then I also just saw them with each other. I'd bring them back and have them do some scenes together just to see if they had chemistry together because um, they would have to be best friends. And, you know, just I kind of trust my instincts even more now than I did then. So you're talking uh, about um, like love at first sight and some of the partnerships. If we go to the before trilogy, hmm. how did you meet or how did the Ethan Hawke, <clears throat> Julie Delpy, collaboration and yeah, partnership was, start? Yeah, it was, I, I remember I was just casting. Um, I met, I remember I was casting in Los Angeles that day and Julie Delpy was like the second person I met came in and you, you know, it's kind of like job applicants or something. The first one couldn't be the best, you know, so you, it's unfair to be the first and what you imagine will be a long process. So Julie was like the second actor I met and uh, I liked her a lot. She had, had this great resume. She's very interesting. And at that point, at that point, I, I think I wasn't even sure if I was going to go American female or European female. It could have gone either way. What nationality fit? What gender? I just wanted the two most interesting, kind of intelligent, creative people I could find to try to make that film work. You know, what I had in the script really had to go a lot farther to work as a movie. 
and around that time I went to a play that one of my dazed actors, Anthony Rapp, who plays Tony in that movie, he was in a play in New York at a little theater company that um, was called Sophistry. And Ethan Hawke was in that play. And it was actually his theater company, he and a, a, this collective. They had started a theater company. And so I'd never met Ethan, but I went to this play and we got to talking after. Because I had seen him in some movies, but he was kind of a teenager. I was looking for something older, but I realized, oh, he's now that age. You know, you can't really judge an actor because what you're seeing on the screen is probably them a year and a half ago. You know, especially a young actor, they're changing and, you know, evolving so quickly. So um, we got to talking. But then I had a callback um, where I, I mixed and matched. I had four actors total and I had them do scenes with each other. And, you know, Ethan at that time was. He was already a young star. He was one of those guys getting every Hollywood part for a young person. You know, someone in that age range was he was getting offered. So he told me years later he he was a little stunned when he realized he was kind of auditioning. He wasn't just getting offered the part. But then he said he kind of respected it. You know, he really because I said, well, if it doesn't work, you know, I, I'm doing you and me a favor. You know, we want to make sure it worked. And you know, he's auditioning me too. You know, so in a, in the day of callbacks, we really got to work together. You know, rewriting a scene, throwing in ideas, finding some more humor. And I think we got a sense of what he and Julie sat down together and we worked on a scene and I saw they sort of hit it off. And, uh, you know, I liked the way they looked together. But, you know, there were two other actors there that day, too. So it could have gone a different way. But once I saw them, I was pretty sure those were, those were my two for that movie. But I would have never predicted, you know, that was 90 94 you know i wouldn't have predicted all these years later we would have made two more two more films together and it would become this kind of life project partnership wonderful collaboration that it became but it has been a great joy seeing those two artists you know develop you know in their own lives and you know they were kid they were 23 then yeah so. so when you started the writing and um and filmmaking of the first before film did you did you have a sense that maybe there would be other ones no. That would follow? No, no way. And we didn't, I didn't really have anything after that. You know, it was just like, it was so much about that one night in their lives. It never really, I think the question was asked, because it's set up, oh, six months later, do they get back to, you know, every now and then someone would ask, do they get together six months later? But no one ever, I guess because the film wasn't like a big hit or anything, you know, no one asked for a sequel for a film that's not financially successful. You know, it's usually an economic thing that drives a sequel. So no one ever was clamoring for a sequel. We started making a joke when we were doing Before Sunset. It's like the lowest grossing film to ever spawn a sequel. <laughs> we were, <laughs> it was like three people wanted that film um, <laughs> by that time. But it took us five years, I think. Actually, they, they came to Austin. We did a little scene in my animated film, Waking Life, that got them back together vaguely in character, even though technically they're kind of playing each other. They've switched roles in some weird way. But... Um, after that weekend we worked together, we looked at each other and said, hey, you know, we should. Jesse and Celine were still alive in us and had something to say. We felt about a new phase of life they were in. So that's how that worked. But it took five, that was five solid years later. And then the next time it was another five solid years <laughs> before we had any ideas for, of what the next phase of life might hold for them. And I'm still in that five-year window if they'll ever. <laughs> so I have no ideas about if we'll ever if the trilogy's over it may w very well be but i don't don't know he was um he was here a couple of years ago and was speaking about how his version of how he met you um was love at first sight that you were up all night talking and then yeah, started working and at and night at the theater we went on we went and got some drinks later with some of the guys in the theater company and you know new york you know you just kind of yeah it's four in the morning before you know it you know? Um, but he was also crediting you for giving him the confidence that to now be a writer. Um, so. Well, that's a little generous because at that time, Ethan had already written a novel. <laughs> he got off the plane. He's like, you know, I'm getting some. Sh I got this novel. I wrote. Oh, you wrote a novel. You got a theater company. You're one of the biggest young stars in Hollywood. He had directed a movie. He had the number one music video that summer. This Lisa oh, Loeb yeah. thing he did. He would like was already writing music. Now Ethan is in another world as far as like artistic creativity outlet. He's, he's kind of an incredible, I've never met anyone quite like that. You know, directing theater, acting in theater, you know, he's, he's kind of an amazing, just an amazing guy to know, you know, so. So 
Let's watch a scene from um, the final of, or not the final, the third of the tri- of the series, the third of, of of the twenty. Okay, that, it's uh, over we'll now. We'll say it first. Twenty before midnight. Um, Jesse and Celine are in a car with. They're now um, they're now together, and they have twin daughters, and they're in a car. So we'll show the film. That's a long scene. We'd be here long. It's a little bit of it. So, <laughs> the real you, actors in that scene, the, the two twin girls in the back, they like, aren't actually asleep. That was so, <laughs> I was just holding my breath the whole time. Because you know how kids are, they like look up. You know, it's, uh, yes. <laughs> so, part of pulling this in was thinking about if you go from junior high to high school and that's more freedom, and then you go to high school to college and that's more freedom, then thinking about this scene is, is this saying, you know, you get to adulthood and it's like entrapment in a car, fighting about... <laughs> well, they're pretty far to an adulthood at this point. Yeah. They're in their 40s and, you know, uh, they're 41 or so with kids and, you know, so they've had 20 years of adulthood. So. Uh, do you remember, you know, we're going to move on to boyhood. I'm just sure. thinking of the time yeah. right now. We have um, transitioned to it and somewhere. thinking about, yeah, let's get mm-hmm. a, a, a huge applause talking about boyhood. <laughs> it's been referred to, it's been lauded as a masterpiece. It was a leap of faith of 12 years of production, a few days um, each year. Um, you wrote about the germ of the idea of boyhood coming from Truffaut's 400 Blows, and then you took that in a different direction. Can you talk a little bit about Well, I don't think that was the direct inspiration, but that is the kind of the cornerstone of the genre. I I was feeling at a certain point, I guess I was turning 40-ish and was thinking, I'd expressed kind of autobiographically different points of my life at that point, but I I suddenly felt, and I think it was being a dad, my daughter at that point, you know, seven or so, and I'm seeing her life, you know, every day. And it gets you thinking about your own childhood. So I was like, ah, you know, I never thought I had a little kids film in me necessarily. But I started thinking about childhood and I felt, oh, there's a movie, you know, what's my movie about growing up? You know, then you you go into the the best films of that. And I think, you know, Looming Large is 400 Blows, you know, Truffaut's first film that's so great. But I, I realized I didn't really have my 400 Blows moment. That film covers just a few days in the life of young, you know, Antoine Duanuel. And uh, my ideas of what I wanted to depict covered all the years. I didn't have like one moment of childhood that meant all of it. And I realized my eyes, ideas were dispersed over all the years, little things. And so that's not really a movie, you know, with a, you have the limitation of the young actor. You can't ask a seven year old, okay, now you're 13, you know, you can't, Oh, now even nine, you know, they change so much and you have cinema, cinemas really restricted that way. I felt the straitjacket of representation, you know, it's like we all buy the idea that you could, okay, here's the little kid and now they're an adult. Maybe there's a marking, you know, a mole or something that's similar or just something that'll say, okay, that's them. You just buy it. Okay, that's them now grown up. Because what are you going to do? Um, we just buy the, the fiction of that. But if you get... I think there's like a 10 year minimum to buy. You can't just cast someone else and say, oh, now you're one year older. It's like, well, it's not the same. You know, how are you going to do it? So I'd kind of given up on the idea is what I'm getting at as far as a film. Like I realized my ideas and what I was trying to express wouldn't, couldn't really be a movie. So I was going to write maybe a novel. I I wanted to, you know, this strange novel I thought I had in mind. And I sat down to do that. And then the form of boyhood jumped in my mind. Well, it was like, well, why couldn't you film a little bit every year? And it solved my problem, you know, technically. But it was one of those kind of aha moments that came from a long time of, uh, you know, just problem solving. I had a narrative problem on my hands. But then I, it also kind of feeds into what I think about storytelling and cinema. I'd, in a way, I'd probably been working on that for 20 years of thinking went into that. Some of my, you know kind of theories and thinking about cinema kind of merged with that particular problem solving in a film that I thought could work, but again, it's kind of hard to explain. That was a, that's an interesting pitch. Give me money and 13 years from now, we'll have a thing, they're like, 
People had the strangest looks. I should have just taken pictures of all the <laughs> odd looks I got from, from people as I tried to talk them into doing that movie. But never from the artist. You know, Ethan Hawke, I talked to, he's like, cool, that's crazy, that's insane. Yeah, I want to do it. You know, call it Patricia Arquette. I'd only met her once. She's like, yeah, 12 years, that's crazy. Yeah, that's, they just saw the artistic challenge in it. We're like, yeah, I mean, you got to love actors, you got to love artists, because they kind of get something like, like that. But uh, financiers and the more practical side, it was just an <laughs> odd thing. But I got very lucky, IFC Productions. Uh, came aboard for the ride, and we did it very low budget, you know, so I jokingly um, said that I, I pitched them, you know, like most indie films don't make money. They would lose their money very slowly, incrementally. <laughs> it, they could write it off every year, and they would hardly notice by the end, so <laughs> it worked, you know, so. Um, so we will show a clip from Boyhood. It's part of the uh, tail end of the movie. Um, yeah, we'll just show the clip and discuss it. it. It's weird to see that scene out of context. For that to really resonate, you have to invest like two hours and a half <laughs> before it. To <laughs> but I guess it works on its own. I'm pretty confident <laughs> everyone in here has seen Boyhood. Yeah, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I just saw Eller the other day. He saw this new movie, and he came up and gave me a big hug. He really liked it. Because I told him when we were shooting The End of Boyhood, it's, you know, I have this other movie that kind of begins right where this ends. Yeah. You know, like Boyhood ends, a guy going off to college, and this begins with a guy showing up at college. So, so you'd clearly mapped very, very out... Very, very different guy. But. Very different guy. <laughs> you'd clearly mapped out a lot of this, a lot of this film. Why, why this scene? Oh, this one in, we just saw, yeah. Boyhood? Oh, the film had to, it had to get there, that break from mom and, and childhood, you know, it had to come to an end. So I felt that scene coming for many, many years, and I always knew that movie would end. I had a structure, I had it all planned out, but um, year to year the dialogue would come, and I remember talking to Patricia the year before, it's like, well, you know, off to college, this is the last kid leaving, you know, so we knew what was coming. And I had that time. He has a different kind of goodbye with his father than his mother. It's very different emotionally. And uh, it was fun to spend that year kind of building up to that and talking about it. And, and even talking to friends like my my producer, Kathleen, her daughter had gone off to college right like a few months before we filmed that. And uh, she said she was crying and called her from the airport and told her, like, just so you know, this was the, is the worst day of my life. I said, you told your daughter that? It's like, oh, yeah. He goes, yeah, I told her. It's like, oh, yeah. It's like, well, it's all about mom, isn't it? And so I was kind of like, in my own life, I, I was saying goodbye, and my mom was sitting at a table smoking and just kind of quiet. And it, it took me years to realize what she might have been going through, her youngest leaving. She was like, okay, bye. You know, she didn't, there wasn't a lot of dialogue. So in one, my early, simplest version, it had that. But then I felt the scene needed to deliver more of an exchange, like the movie needed more back and forth to actually, you know, express all that and talking to a lot of moms and having experienced it myself. My, my oldest daughter had gone off to college and that. And, you know, so it's a big moment both in a, you know, young person's life and it means two very different things. To a, The movie's about growing up, but it's also about parenting. And that's a very different thing when your kid leaves. So... It's, it's both those things. It's a very different experience. So, I love it. It's like one polite, everyone stop. Um, <laughs> so, shifting from boyhood to everybody wants some, you go from 12 years, a span of 12 years, and then can you tell everyone what the time frame is and kind of set up the film before we watch it of, yeah. of what, what they're about to watch? Boyhood and everybody wants some, believe it or not, are actually like, film cousins to one another in my mind. They, they started, I had the idea for both of them around the same time. Around the time I was conceiving and starting Boyhood, I was also thinking about this college film I wanted to, to do. And they just happened to sort of come to the finish line at the same time. One, strictly theoretical, I wrote the script probably seven years ago and then tried to get it made. It never, it was on this parallel track of wanting to become a film while I was shooting Boyhood every year. 
and I can attest that it's actually harder to shoot a film every year than want to make a film every year. You know, thinking about a film for 10 years is easier than actually making a film for that. <laughs> but um, they did kind of come to the finish line when I was shooting the last scene. You know, I was like, hey, that film, I have a film I want to do. It starts like right where this ends. And it just happened that they, you know, one followed the next. So in a way, everybody wants some personally as a continuation of Boyhood. It's like what happens. So I was, you know, that's that. But it's it's really more of a sequel to to Days and Confused. If you think of Mitch, the young guy who keeps pitching, if he if he kept pitching and was good enough and went off to college on a baseball scholarship. So it's it's both a continuation and a sequel. Okay, well jumping back in time, you know, whatever. Let's let them watch it. Who and cares? Then- I hope you like the movie. It's it's a big Fundamentally, it's just a big party movie, <laughs> and it's it's my it's my best version of college, which means it, y- there's no class yet. It's that party before, before you actually have to attend class. So it's that long weekend of uh, before you have any real obligations or responsibility at college. But it's about you know bonding and finding out who your new best friends are. So enjoy. <laughs> so anyway, Everybody anyway, wants like some, it. and we'll okay. come back Thanks, for a Q and A. Everyone, the filmmaker of Everyone Wants More. Oh, yeah. oh, no. I'm going to steal your water. Yeah, you can it's steal okay. it. It's okay. We have a little present for you. A present? Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, Blue Jay's hat. All right, you know. Did you guys catch that reference oh, in the movie? Yeah. yeah, did you like my little O Canada Oh, he yeah. puts it back in the bag and not on his head. I see how this is going to go. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, I, so I'm, why, I'm an Astros guy. Why you know, the, um, I appreciate it. But, uh, no. Why the O Canada? <laughs> where did the O Canada game come from? Well, you know, that was a real thing. So much of this movie, like, really happened. So these guys had this game they called O Canada. And I think it's based, maybe someone here knows, I believe it's a reference in the baseball movie Bang the Drum Slowly. Anybody on this wavelength? I think there was a game. But anyway, these guys had taken it to another level. And like it is in the movie, I'm pretty sure they were just they would just make stuff up. Yeah. That was my perspective of what they were doing, but it was it was kind of witty, weird thing. You know, I don't know. It found its way into the movie. So this group, but was one of the guys on the team, Wyatt Russell, had played hockey, and he knew oh, he right. knew all the lyrics, so we could play it out much longer and have fun with the. You know, most Americans only know like the first part. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, you had to immerse this entire crew into the '80s. How did you do that? How did you build camaraderie, and how did AD, you get you know yeah. the a, you know it's very specific kind of. I really thought 80, 1980 was kind of the end of the '70s. You know what people think of the '80s, what '82, '83, you know somewhere in there. But but you know you just jump in, you get those details. Is the music, of course, a lot of references. You know, look at I would show them movies. You know, we all lived together for a f- several weeks. I have this um, bunkhouse on this property I have outside of Austin. And I just put them all in it. It's like, okay, you guys are roommates. They're all all living together, and we would just work all day. Uh, you know, rehearse, play, watch movies at night. It was total immersion. You know, it was fun, fun. But a lot of music, and then just you know, looking at yearbooks, pictures, and movies. And they love it. And is there, you know, the mustaches, hair, is all that came in. They were, it kind of really helped them dial in. I think on their characters, you know. But they were always asking us, do you guys really wear stuff this tight? And all that's like, <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> okay, let's open it up to you because I know there's a full house and I'm sure there's going to be really good questions. Uh, you have to wait for the microphone and someone's going to, it's super bright, so I can't see um, that, that video where the at microphone the end, is. Oh, go ahead and call on someone and I'll just yep. talk. To them. That video at the end is something the, the cast sort of came up with on their own. They were doing that as a side project. I noticed, but then they showed it to me. I said, "This is great. Let's put it over the end of the credits." Because so, it was weird. They did it in their characters. It seemed <laughs> seemed kind of fitting. You know. Hey, uh, great movie. Uh, super simple question: Was there really a guy like Willoughby that was just thirty and took <laughs> off? We theorized there was. Uh, one of the guys. Well, I was a freshman, and he was this guy who came in. His last name was Knutson. He came in from Spokane. He said. And he was kind of a senior. 
he was one of our best pitchers. He went like eight and two, and then he just sort of disappeared. You know, we still, we couldn't, we all got together recently, and I showed all my old teammates the film, and we couldn't track him down. We were trying to get him. But it became the theory just because he kind of drifted in and drifted out, and he, he like, played backgammon and drank coffee and read the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, he, he wasn't like chasing freshman girl. You know, he was just a little more, you know, grad student age women. And he, was, he wasn't a stoner like the guy in this movie, but he was a great guy to talk to and just seemed kind of composed. And I don't know. So years later, I was talking to one of my teammates. He goes, I think Knudsen was 30. You know, I think he was just going. So it's more of a local myth, you know. I don't know if he was or not, but... You know, I'll let you know if we ever find him. I don't think he existed. You know, back then you could kind of assume an identity a lot easier pre everything being computerized. So, did he tell you to embrace your inner strange? Uh, not in those words, but uh, yeah, he he was a cool guy though. I, I liked his. He had a Zen calm about him. But Wyatt Russell, the actor who plays him, uh, really ran with it. We had a lot of fun with that part. And he's a musician too. He he kind of brought that little. You know, I, I like Van Halen, but he he did that thing where he he kind of rips on him. But he's he's thirty, so that would be his point of view. You know. So anyway, we we had a lot of fun with all that. So. Okay, where is the mic now? Is he the goal? Yep. Hey, um, I just wanted to say first off that your movies are awesome and made me <laughs> want to go to film school. So thanks for being you. Um, and second of all, I just wanted to know. Um, you talked in the before series how along the way you kind of had the idea of a sequel and wanted to go back to that world. And this feels a lot like Days and Confused, like you talked about, and like what kind of sparked you going back to, to that place or, or what in your life kind of inspired that? To go back to, to this movie? Yeah. To yeah. That, like idea. Days came early. You know, I was like, oh, high school years. I felt like I needed to deal with that or that was some, something that felt kind of present worthy of exploration. I think I was less conflicted about college. You know, like college is a lot more fun than high school. So I had less demons to <laughs> deal with. So I, it hit me just, I guess more recently, I was just thinking about it as a, a maturation, transformational moment more than my own experience. But then when I started thinking about it too, like, oh, well, 1980, it was an interesting time culturally. So I just, I started wrapping my head around it. And also, that particular environment I found myself in w amongst a bunch of athletes who were kind of crazy competitive, I started seeing that as more humorous, you know. So I don't know, it just took me years to kind of wrap my head around it. But once I did, it was it was a lot of fun. But, you know, it's, it was a... When we were shooting days, it was only 16 years in the past, from 92 to 76. This movie was 30, you know, four years in the past, so... But uh, it didn't really feel that far. I don't think the culture changes, you know, that much, really. Yep. Uh, yeah. You guys were talking earlier about movies that are kind of a time and a place in people's lives. And uh, one that you did that I really enjoyed was Suburbia. And it kind of reminded me of Days to Confuse, just in the sense of like a young sort of unknown cast and uh, yeah. taking place all over one night. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that movie. Yeah, Suburbia is, I think that's the only film of mine that's not really available so much on DVD or I think it, you can see it some places now, but it's been more, more or less lost, you know. Um, did that in 90, came out in 97. But yeah, for me, that was kind of a, I'd done Before Sunrise and Days and Confuse and it, it kind of fit this interim early 20s, post high school, but you know, how your life is very different at that stage. But I mean, it's people who are stuck kind of back in their hometown. Maybe there was a little college, but they're in and around. So, yeah, that one meant a lot to me at the time, but it was kind of a depiction about how much life is is different once you're not in that academic environment. And the world's a little less forgiving, a little harsher on people in their 20s who are figuring it out. You know, teenagers, they kind of give a break too, but at some point it's like, you know, get your act together. The world gets more tough, so... I was kind of exploring that and the sort of dead endness of, of that town. So it was based on an Eric Bogosian play. So I don't know. It was a low budget film we did that I was I was happy with, but I, th I think you can see it somewhere. You have to kind of hunt it down. So um, it's funny how some films sort of fall off your resume. People never mention it, but but you did. So thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
the red really? light over there. Yep. Hey, um, so Raw Dog was very humorous, and I enjoyed the character, but he was somewhat different tonally. How do you balance? Could you stand up? Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna, sorry. Yeah, I'm okay. just really tall. That's cool. I don't wanna, <laughs> um, so I really enjoyed the character Raw Dog, and I thought he was a humorous character, but he was somewhat different tonally. How do you find that balance, yeah. and where do you? Yeah, like I don't know, it's a different. Don't know. Well, there's like they say in the movie, there's always every team has some a couple weirdos whose energy is very different and they're just a bigger personality. And that was really the case on this team I played in. There was this one pitcher who was just kind of, you know, more out there. It was about himself and it's just a little crazier and just very contrary to, to everybody else. So it kind of was, it was odd. But that actor, Justin Street, um, he really ran with it. You know, he'd played a little pro ball. I think he had pitched in the uh, A's organization. He played some college ball. And I needed a, a guy who, you know, like all the guys, I wanted, you know, guys who could play or were athletes. And he's not like that. That's pure character work. But he, you know, I was talking to him about the part. And he's like, yeah, I know that guy. Every team, every team, he could name that guy on various teams he had been on. So it's not uncommon that there's one person who's just, just different. So it was really fun to work with him on that characterization. I kind of encouraged him to go out there. And he was one of these actors who would just kind of keep bringing stuff. It was really fun to rehearse with. And he would just come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. So it was really pulling him back, if anything. So he, he was he was funny, very funny. Um, wherever the... Hi. Oh, there you go. Um, really loved the movie, and the soundtrack is epic. Can you please talk about the music? Because oh, it's yeah. amazing. Well, there's going to be a double vinyl album. Oh, Warner's know. Records is putting out soundtracks. Not that anybody buys soundtracks anymore, but... Double vinyl and a cassettes too. I don't know. So I, I think the double vinyl has more songs technically, and that's still not all the songs in the movie. So yeah, the music was was really fun. That was um, I don't know. Just I had like two hundred songs I started with. You know when I was writing and you know that era because it was a lot like the movie. You know you, one night you all these different genres were out there. But at that time, I remember being most excited about kind of like new wave and punk stuff but you know you you went to the discos you went to the country bars you know that was all kind of culturally kind of happening at one time at least from where i lived you know but but yeah music's such a big part of it um at that age it was felt like your life was wall-to-wall -wall music you know you had the stereo blaring at home stereo in the car wherever you arrived the party or the club there was music and it was just a big a big mix so it was just fun kind of uh you know going back hearing all that and explaining to the guys you know sort of like well you don't because they they were liking some of the disco it's like no no you can't technically admit to liking disco <laughs> you go there for the drink specials and the girls or you know whatever takes you to the club but you can't admit it but you know trust me 30 years later you you actually do like all that music it's it, it, it it's aged well most of it but at the time you were more likely to have a disco sucks t-shirt you know <laughs> rock and roll you know it was, a, it was a weird battle that was going on at that moment you know over here. Hi there. I really loved pretty much everything you've done. So I'm just kind of curious if you've been approached in terms of doing any content in different formats versus film, like anything on the streaming content or TV or what other projects you might be working on. Sure. I think everybody is all the time. You know, every movie, even this movie, when I was trying to get it financed over the years, the first question out of people's mouths was, hey, could it be a TV show? You know, can you do a TV series? You want to stream a TV? You know, so... I had those options, I think, always, but I, I don't know. I'm kind of I like the feature film format is still my main thing. But certain stories I I like the idea of a long form five to ten hour movie on cable, you know, or whatever one hour a week, whatever form that is. What Todd Haynes did with Mildred Pierce or you know Olive Kittredge, you know, I kind of think that has a, a lot of potential for a certain kind of story, but. Um, yeah, but for the most part, I'm I'm kind of a feature film guy, I guess. So, <laughs> is that old school? I don't know. <laughs> that's just how I that's how I think. Thank you for that and for being here tonight. Uh, your movies have such a raw and immersive quality to it. I was wondering if you could just describe your approach to writing something like that. Oh gosh, you know. Different movies are, you know, kind of have different approaches sometimes. But uh, this, since it was so personal, kind of largely out of my own life and observations and memories, so I just start 
I spent a few years just jotting down notes and characters and ideas, jokes, a song. You know, I just keep general notes. And then at some point I just sit down and, and hammer out a script. But to me, the creative part is really the, that year of year or a couple years sometimes of just thinking about it and outlining it and, and all that. I had an early version of this. My very first draft of this was actually covered the entire freshman year. It starts and it had just picked up little bits all the way across and ends at the end of the season. But it was like 180 pages. It was just very sprawling. And I was it, it had everything. And I realized pretty quickly I could kind of compress all of it into that time structure of the opening, you know, that weekend before classes start. So that when I had that idea structurally, it kind of brought it all together. And I was able to kind of bring everything I liked, I think, into it and then skip all the you know, all the boring stuff, the class and baseball and stuff. I could leave that out. You know, just get to the essence of the characters, you know. So I don't know if that's true. It would be a very different thing. I could have made the 10 hour uh, TV show out of it, probably. But. Yep. Um, your writing is so beautiful. And I was wondering, as just a writer and a director, how do you, or I guess, how much do you let the actors go off the page? And how much do you let them, in, like, I guess, interpret what they want? I really um, encourage it in the in the rehearsal workshop area. I never want to turn on a camera and not know. You know, I don't usually have the budget or schedule to just, hey, let's try stuff. You know, but that three weeks of intensive rehearsal workshop, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm. It was so necessary for them to live together and just to get each other's rhythms and senses of humor. And I'm, I think it's the the. The, probably the six smaller parts, if you look at all the guys, the, there's probably six larger parts that were a little more filled out on the page, and six where I'd, I'd realize I have a character's name, but he only has four lines, and they're basically interchangeable with some other guy. So, you know, that's kind of not very distinguished. So, you know, you cast the best person you can, and then you kind of rewrite it, and you you sort of boost that part based on what they're bringing. And, you know, you, you cast it right, and you get the right people in there, and you create an atmosphere where they feel free to kind of play with ideas. So, you know, even if at later at night we're shooting pool or hanging out and, you know, I'm still working and they're still working, even though we're sort of farting around, we're still talking about their character and what they might do in a scene and little things kind of emerge out of that. So that's the, really, to me, the, the fun, the most fun creative moments are in that place where the script's meeting the, the actor. And I've, I always encourage that to bring it to life whether it's I do that with Julie and Ethan I do that with who, whoever you know that to me that's the most crucial moment you know but so much of it they brought to answer your question yeah so much of the humor and a lot of that I think they they participated in in kind of helping me rewrite it I guess it's the, maybe a technical term uh, hi, um, I'm kind of nervous a little bit, but I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, I really enjoyed this film. Um, and while this is a retrospective of your life, I'd like to um, mention um, two, two films that I feel kind of fall under the radar a little bit, Waking Life and A Scanner Darkly. Um, and I feel those films are so new wave and punk and so ahead of its time in terms of the rotoscope animation. There's something so very hypnotic about it. It's sadly not as prominent and I'd like to know your take on um, why you think that is. Well, both those films were, they're that strange thing of like indie animation. There's not a lot of that, you know. Um, and then computer animation and, um, you know, that was just, I, I love both those films, but they were, um, I just felt that that was the way they should be seen and, you know, they're very different in their own way. But um, I think both those films have their own following. I, I get, I've had feedback over the years for both of those. So, um, but, um, so I'm sorry, what was the, 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 the question in there more was? Yes, the question was really how you feel, um, um, the question was really why you think those, why do you think rotoscope animation isn't as prominent oh, now? Oh, yeah. Um, I think everybody's trained just with the, you know, the Pixar, the current model has everybody, you know. But I mean, animation can be anything, you know. I, I think it's such a wide open field that it's a little disappointing commercially when you feel it kind of narrow to one certain 
you know, 3D animation look. So I have another animated film I'm, I'm trying to make that's kind of, we're calling it like two and a half D. <laughs> you know, it's not quite that, but it's more painterly. You know, it's some hybrid. It's not rotoscoping, that computer variant of rotoscoping we were doing there. But, you know, it, it seems like it has a lot of potential. But the, the nut to crack is adult, you know, can adults, you know. I like Charlie Kaufman's last film. You know, that's kind of stop motion, but, you know, it, it can be anything. I just think people should be great if they were more open to stories that are have that, you know, different looks and feels. I think they do. They catch up to it eventually. It just it seems a little weird, and I don't mind that either, you know, so whatever. It, it can be anything. You need adventurous audiences to, to take it on, and, and the look's got to be appropriate to the subject matter, too. You mentioned one of your projects. Can you talk about some projects that you're working on? Because, you know, you think about it, 95 to 2013, you had before. Boyhood was 12 years. You're thinking about this one in 2012. So we know you have projects you've been working on since, like, 2009. I, I do, but I haven't been, like, shooting any. I have some I've been working on this whole century, <laughs> um, but I haven't made yet. So, But I, I'm reading and researching. Some are historical, and I have a kind of – I'm calling it, like, an artist trilogy that I'm, I'm trying to do maybe soon kind of – artists my film me and orson wells was kind of one of them but let's take an, art, an artist's life and a, a moment in the career that's kind of usually the beginning or the end of the, the artistic life so i have a couple other films in that kind of in that stuff you know style genre whatever it is so that i've been developing and i don't know i have a lot of other stuff a you know, bunch of bunch of projects you know you can't ever i don't necessarily know what's next it's always based on you know, financing and cast availability and all that good stuff. So I got the signal. We have time for two questions. Oh. So there's going to be uh, two glowing sticks that direct me. Here's one of them. Go ahead. A uh, huge fan. Uh, was wondering, um, picking up off the waking life question, um, it's always, especially since boyhood, um, the scene, uh, the sacred moment in which... Um, your main character is watching on a screen two, two guys, basically just one guy going on a rant about Andre Bazin's film theory. Mm -hmm. And one wonders how much of it was scripted or how much one of uh, how much of it was just recorded. Um, but thinking about your catalog as a whole, um, that idea of the sacred moment kind of... Um, holy moment. Yeah. The holy moment, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the Same thing, probably. <laughs> it's the only it's the only scene which is preceded by a title, interestingly yeah, enough, in yeah. that in that movie. Um, the name of the film they might be watching, in in whatever state of consciousness. Right. Have. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering how much of that kind of um, theoretical approach, which is just kind of you know loosely articulated within the broader context of mm -hmm. the movie, is really indicative of um, kind of a more cinematic approach to. Uh, your work. I also say that with in mind, uh, keeping in mind that I've seen pretty much every interview you've ever been in, and um, in fact, Sorry. now that I've got the audience uh, a little bit, but uh, you may have read my writing. Ethan Hawke was at my bookstore in November, and I gave him something to give to you. But anyway, that's a okay. anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, though. Can you frame the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Do us proud. Well, I think I was just wondering how much of that can we take away in terms of your overall approach with film. If, and how much of it is a statement? If, if it's in the movie, I mean, a film like Waking Life is really a film about ideas. And it wasn't necessarily whether you agree or disagree. Is, is it provocative and does it fit into that movie? And for me, something self-reflexive about that that's about cinema, that's about storytelling, fits in that movie. Because I always saw that movie as a film that's becoming aware of itself as a movie, if that's possible. That was just one ongoing thought I had the whole way. So... It was, uh, that was appropriate. And I do, you know, all, all that I find interesting, you know, Bazan and even the notion that the best movies don't come from the best scripts. You know, like it's not a literary medium. So I always, I mentioned that earlier, I sometimes struggle with having this these sheets of paper that are a bunch of ideas be a coherent film. Someone has to make a leap of faith. But I always like the new wave directors who wouldn't even have a necessarily a finished script. It was just, you know, good art. We have a notebook, a bunch of ideas. Write the dialogue or the thing that morning or the night before. And, you know, that film could be this living, breathing, process-oriented exploration, you know, of a subject or, you know, that, that I think there's a place for that. Unfortunately, 
the industry kind of requires the financing. Everything that has to happen is a more systematic thing that people are judging you at every stage. So you have to get that script, I mean, as good as you can, as consumer friendly as possible to even get the opportunity, you know, to, to make it as a film. So that, that can be a struggle sometimes. If what you, if the final film you're going for, you can't demonstrate on a page or anything, it's, it's gonna be found in its process. People investing a lot of money don't want to hear you're going to find it, you know, later. <laughs> Usually, no, no matter your track record, you know, or whatever they might think. Whomever has the mic. Ooh, hello. Um, I got to meet you a little bit earlier today, but it was sort of in a rush. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for making Boyhood. I'm, uh, I was born in 94, just like uh, Eller Coltrane. Right. I'm a child of divorce, so that movie mm. just really resonated with me. Yeah, just want to thank you. Oh, thanks. And um, my question isn't related to Boyhood or this movie. I was just wondering about tape. It's all sort of real time, and I was wondering what the like problems that came with making a movie that took place in two hours. You are in that case like 80 something, 80 minutes or so. Yeah, right. 80 something. <coughs> He's talking about a film I did, and it came out the same time, Waking Life, in 2001, tape. And I'd been sort of building up to that movie for a while. I even joked about it like, oh, Slacker was 24 hours. I was making these 24, 18, 12 hour time constraints. And I always made a joke, well, someday I'll do like a real time movie that, it, you know, like I think Bergman's Winter Light or, you know, some of those were actually like real time. I thought, well, that's, that's a challenge. And then tape was an unproduced play that Ethan Hawke read and sent it to me and said, hey, you know, we can, we had a kind of an open invite to do like a digital film for no money. And we got kind of obsessed with that. And so I was like, yeah, like how could that work? So we shot it in six days, two digital cameras. But it, the, the narrative structure I found really interesting, like a real time thing. And I ended up doing that just a couple films later, you know, with Before Sunset, but I don't think I would have been able to do Before Sunset had I not done tape right before because that's that's a it's a big challenge you know when you go real time you can't really it's hard to cut anything out <laughs> you know it all has to work you can't just jump around you know in time so uh, it necessitates kind of a preparation that's pretty uh, pretty uh, strenuous you know it's like doing a play even though you're making a film uh, that element of it has to be you know before sunset you you couldn't cut out everything. It, with the day you're shooting, you know, like some movies, you can go, like, well, maybe the pacing of this, I can trim a little bit of this and keep the movie going, make a choice, but you, you couldn't, you know, couldn't in that film. So you're, the day you're shooting is, that's going to be kind of the content of your final movie. You better get it right. So, um, but I found that a, a really, it was a very fun, challenging film to make. So thanks for seeing it. Another one, not seen that much. but. So earlier on, you mentioned that the Austin Film Society is having its 30th anniversary. 30 years, yes. Congratulations. I know. I'm, and that you... I'm like the proud, proud yeah. father of a 30-year-old. And that you uh, will sometimes go to schools and you'll, or, and you also program film series. So yeah. I asked you, you know, I told you that um, Guillermo del Toro or Professor GDT will come and do some master classes and pitch. Guillermo, he's wonderful. He lived in Austin for a while. That's why I got to know him. Oh, he's so lovely. Mm -hmm. But he will focus on a certain topic. So I asked you if you were going to do a course, um, if you were going to teach a course, and you know, you asked if it had to be a syllabus or one day, and I said Whatever. it's it's up to you. What would what would you have this group watch or think about or focus on? <coughs> You know, I think I would. I'm on the on the fly here. I I would think. I think the three best books about cinema by filmmakers by directors to me are *Sculpting in Time* by Andrei Tarkovsky, *Notes on Cinematography* by Robert Bresson, and then um, in a way I, I would say Bergman wrote a couple of memoirs that are great, but I read. Not that long ago, um, Ilya Kazan's A Life. Very different, those three books. But I would really show films by those three directors and ask you to read those books and go through and find examples, not only in their work, but other work they reference. So it would be kind of through, and you could teach a year-long class on, you know, 
on not only their films, but everything they talk about and kind of their ideas about cinema and what it is. Very, very different, all three, but very, very personal, especially Tarkovsky and Brisson. Very much like their um, films themselves. You know, Brisson's are very elliptical, aphoristic, um, just observations about what cinema can do. And then Tarkovsky, flowing, poetic, lengthy, very beautiful, um, just about life and art and you know, poetry and cinema and Brisson's are kind of like his movies. They keep it keeps it moving. So, and I throw in Kazan there just because it's a. I think I wish I would have read it 20 years before I did. I, I would have been a better director. So, wow, that's lovely. So those are three. Those are three books. There's a lot more, <laughs> but the, I would for some reason those three were on my mind at this moment. That's a good start for us, right? Brisson, Tarkovsky, Kazan. So please join me in thanking our guest tonight for sharing Thank you film. guys. And, and thank you for having me here. You, you guys are very lucky to be in Toronto. This is such a beautiful place you have here. Don't take it for granted. Keep supporting it. You know, so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>